Hello, I am Emily Rowden Fuller, your Executive Director of Recycled Shakespeare Company, Northern New England's only grassroots Shakespearean theater. For the past seven seasons, we have been celebrating Shakespeare's birthday throughout downtown Waterville, Maine, at a fabulous event known as the Bard's Birthday Bash. This event is filled with singing, performances, dancing, and most importantly, the reading of all 154 of Shakespeare's sonnets. This year, we are unable to spread cheer through the town as the shops are closed due to COVID-19. Instead, we have taken the celebration to you online. We have participants from across the globe who sent in videos of sonnets, scenes, and songs. So sit back and enjoy a selection of some of the greatest words ever written. Happy 456th birthday, William Shakespeare. Let's party like it's 1599. Sonnet 1 From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. But thou, contracted to thine own bright eyes, feedst thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel, making a famine where abundance lies, thyself thy foe, to thy sweet self too cruel. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament, and only herald to the gaudy spring, within thine own bud buriest thy content, and, tender churl, makest waste in niggarding. Pity the world, or else this glutton be, to eat the world's due by the grave and thee. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, And dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, Thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now, Will be a tottered weed of small worth held. Then being asked where all thy beauty lies, Where all the treasure of thy lusty days, To say within thine own deep sunken eyes, Were an all-eating shame and thriftless praise, how much more praise deserved thy beauty's use, if thou could answer, This fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feel'st it cold. Sonnet number three. Look in thy glass, and tell the face thou viewest. Now is the time that face should form another, whose fresh repair if thou not renewest. Thou dost beguile the world, unbless a mother. For where is she so fair whose unyard womb disdains the tillage of thy husbandry? Or who is he so fond will be the tomb of his self-love to stop posterity? Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. So thou through windows of thine age shalt see, despite of wrinkles, tis thy golden time. But if thou lift, remember not to be, die single, and thine image dies with thee. Sonnet 4 Unthrifty loveliness why dost thou spend upon thyself thy beauty's legacy? Nature's bequest gives nothing, but doth lend. And being frank, she lends to those are free. Then, beauteous niggard, why dost thou abuse the bounteous largesse given thee to give? Profitless usurer, why dost thou use so great a sum of sums, yet canst not live? For having traffic with thyself alone, thou of thyself thy sweet self dost deceive. Then how, when nature calls thee to be gone, what acceptable audit canst thou leave? Thy unused beauty must be tuned with thee, which, used, lives the executor to be. Sonnet 5 Those hours that with gentle work did frame, the lovely gaze where every eye doth dwell, 
will play the tyrants to the very same, and that unfair with fairly doth excel. For never resting time leads summer on to hideous winter and confounds him there. Sap checked with frost and lovely leaves <coughs> quite gone, beauty air snowed and bareness everywhere. Then were not summer's distillation left, a liquid prisoner pent in walls of glass, beauty's effect with beauty where bereft, nor it nor no re remembrance what it was, but flowers distilled, though they were winter's meat, lose but their snow, their substance still lives sweet. Sonnet 6 Then let not winter's ragged hand deface in thee thy summer ere thou be distilled. Make sweet some vile treasure thou some place with beauty's treasure ere it be self-killed. That use is not forbidden usury which happies those that pay the willing loan, that's for thyself to breathe another thee, or ten times happier, be it ten for one, ten times thyself were happier than thou art, if ten of thine ten times refigured thee, then what could death do if thou should depart, leaving thee living in posterity? Be not self-willed, for thou art much too fair to be death's conquest and make worms thine heir. Seven. Lo in the orient, when the gracious light lifts up his burning head, each under eye doth homage to his new appearing sight, serving with looks his sacred majesty. And having climbed the steep up heavenly hill, Resembling strong youth in his middle age, yet mortal looks adore his beauty still, attending on his golden plumage. But when, from the highest pitch, with weary car, like feeble age, he reeleth from the day, the eyes, for duteous, now converted, are from his low track, and look another way, so thou thyself outgoing in thy noon, unlooked, undiest, unless thou get a son. to hear. Why hearest thou music sadly? Sweets with sweet N war not. Joy delights in joy. <laughs> Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly? Or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? If the true concord of sounds, well-tuned sounds be, unions married, they do but sweetly chide thee, who confounds in singleness the parts that thou should hear. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another strikes in each by mutual ordering resembling sire and, ch and child and happy mother who all in one pleasing note do sing song being many seeming one sings this to thee
is Sonnet 9. Is it for fear to wet the widow's eye that thou consumest thyself in single life? Ah, uh, if thou issueless less should hap to die, the world will be like a makeless wife. The world will be thy widow and still weep that thou no form of thee hast left behind when every private widow will may well keep by childless eyes her husband's shape in mind. Look, what an unthrift in the world doth spend, shifts but his place, for still the world enjoys it. But beauty's waste hath in the world an end, and kept unused, the user so destroys it. No love towards others in that bosom sits, that on himself such murderous shame commits. Oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Who oh, say you hear your true love calling? Who oh, say you hear your true love calling? That can sing both high and low. Deny that thou bearst love to any who for thyself art so unprovident. Grant, if thou wilt, thou art beloved of many, but that thou none lovest is most evident. For thou art so possessed with murderous hate that gainst thyself thou stick'st not to conspire, seeking that beauteous roof to ruinate, which to repair should be thy chief desire. Oh, change thy thought that I may change my mind, Shall hate be fairer lodged than gentle love? Be as thy presence is gracious and kind, or to thyself at least kind-hearted prove. Make thee another self for love of me, that beauty may still live in thine or thee. Sonnet 11. As fast as thou shalt wean, so fast thou growest, in one of thine from that which thou departest, and that fresh blood which youngly thou bestowest, thou mayst call thine when thou from youth convertest. Herein lives wisdom, beauty, and increase. Without this folly, age, and cold decay, if all were minded so, the times should cease, and threescore year would make the world away. Let those whom nature hath not made for store, harsh, featureless, and rude, barrenly perish. Look whom she best endowed, she gave thee more, which bounteous gift thou shouldst in bounty cherish. She carved thee for her seal, and meant thereby, thou shouldst print more, not let that copy die. My dog and I are reading Sonnet 12. When do I count the clock that tells the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night? When I behold the violet past prime and sable curls and silvered o'er with white? When lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girdled up in sheaves, borne on the bier with white and bristly beard. Then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake and die as fast as they see others grow. 
and nothing yet time sigh can make defense save greed to brave him when he takes thee home. Oh, that you were yourself. But, love, you are no longer yours, then you yourself here live. Against this coming end you should prepare, and your sweet semblance to some other give. So should that beauty which you hold in lease find no determination. Then you were yourself again, after yourself's decease. When your sweet issue, your sweet form should bear, who let so fair a house fall to decay, which husbandry and honor might uphold, against the stormy gusts of winter's day and barren rage of death's eternal cold? Oh, none but unthrifts. Dear my love, you know you had a father. Let your son say so. Sonnet 14 Not from the stars do I my judgment pluck, and yet methinks I have astronomy. But not to tell of good or evil luck, of plagues, of deaths, or seasons quality. Nor can I fortune to brief minutes tell, pointing to each his thunder, rain, and wind. Or say with princes, if uh, it shall go well. But I oft predict that I in heaven's bind, but from thine eyes my knowledge I derive. And constant stars in them I read such art, as truth and beauty shall together thrive, if from thyself to store thou wouldst convert. Or else of thee this I prognosticate. Thy end is truth and beauty's doom and date. Change your day of youth to sullied night. 
and all in war with time, for love of you, as he takes from you, I engraft you new. Shakespearean Sonnet Number 60 But wherefore do you not a mightier way make war upon this bloody tyrant, time, and fortify yourself and your decay with means more blessed than my barren rhyme? Now stand you on t the top of happy hours, and many maiden gardens yet unset, with virtuous wish would bear your living flowers, much like her than your painted counterfeit. So should the lines of life that life repair, which this time's pencil or my pupil pen, neither inward worth nor outward fair, can make you live yourself in eyes of men. To give away yourself keeps yourself still, and you must live drawn by your own sweet skill. Sonnet 17. Who will believe my verse in time to come if it were filled with your most high deserts? Though yet heaven knows it is but as a tomb which hides your life and shows not half your parts. If I could write the beauty of your eyes and in fresh numbers number all your graces, the age to come would say this poet lies, such heavenly touches ne'er touched earthly faces. So should my papers, yellowed with their age, be scorned, like old men of less truth than tongue, and your true rights be termed a poet's rage and stretched meter of an antique song. But were some child of yours alive that time, you should live twice, in it and in my rhyme. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <laughs> Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot, the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Sonnet 19. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone believe my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possess, desiring this man's art and that man's scope with what I most enjoy content at least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, happily I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at a break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with king. Hello, my name is Christina Kloss, and this is Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream. My mistress with a monster is in love! <laughs> Near to her close and in consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches rude mechanicals who work for bread upon Athenian stalls were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that um, barren sort who Pyramus presented in their sport forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take an ass's knoll fixed I on his head, anon his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes, 
when they him did spy as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye or russet padded choffs many in sort rising and cawing at the gun's report do sever themselves and madly sweep the sky so at his sight away his fellows fly <laughs> and at our stamp your oar and oar one fall Their sense thus weak, lost with their fears thus strong, made senseless, things begin to do them wrong. <gasps> For briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yielders all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear. And left sweet Pyramus translated there, when in that moment so it came to pass, to turn you waked. And straightway laughed an ass. <laughs> a woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou, the master mistress of my passion. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change as is false woman's fashion. An eye more bright than theirs, less false in rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. A man in hue all hues in his controlling, which steals men's eyes and woman's souls amazeth. And for a woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting, and by addition of me thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose nothing. But since she pricked thee out for a woman's pleasure, mine be thy love, and thy love's use their treasure. Number 21. So it is not with me as with that muse, stirred by a painted beauty in this verse, who heaven itself or ornament doth use and every fair with this fair doth rehearse, making a compliment of proud compare with sun and moon, with earth and seas, rich gems, with April's first bo born flowers, and all things rare, that heaven's air in this huge rondeur hymns. Oh, let me true in love, by tr but truly right. And then, believe me, my love is as fair as any mother's child, through not so bright as those gold candles fixed in heaven's air. Let them say more that like of Hersa. Here say, well, I will not phrase that purpose, not to sell. Sonnet 22 My glass shall not persuade me I am old, so long as youth and thou are of one date. But when in thee time's furrows I behold, then look I death my days should expi expiate. <clears throat> For all that beauty that doth cover thee is but the seemly raiment of my heart, which in thy breast doth live, as thine in me. How can I then be elder than thou art? O oh, therefore, love, be of thyself so wary as I, for not, not for myself, but for thee will, bearing thy heart, which I will keep so cherry, as a, as tender nurse her babe ill from faring ill. Presume not on thy heart, when mine is slain. Thou gavest me thine, not to give back again. This is Sonnet 23. As an unperfect actor on the stage who, <laughs> with his fear, is put besides his part 
of some fierce thing replete with too much rage whose strength's abundance weakens his own heart. So I, for fear of trust, forget to say the perfect ceremony of love's right. And in mine own love's strength seem to decay or charged with the burden of mine own love's might. Oh. Let my looks be then the eloquence and dumb procedures of my speaking breast who plead for love and look for recompense. More than that tongue hath more than more expressed. No! <sighs> Learn to read what silent love hath writ. <sighs> to hear with eyes belongs to love's fine wit. Sonnet 24. Mine eyes has played the painter and has steeled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. My body is the frame where in tis held and perspective it is best painter's art. For th through the painter must you see his skill to find where your true image pictured lies, which in my bosom shop is hanging still that have his windows glazed with thine eyes. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done. Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me are windows to my breast, where through the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. Yet eyes this cunning want to grace their art, they draw, but what they see, no, not the heart. All right, so I'm here from the uh, Starfleet uh, Department of Linguistics. It is unknown exactly when uh, the Klingons became affiliated uh, with uh, William Shakespeare, but we do know mic. is by the year 2293, when Chancellor Gorkon met with Captain Kirk by that point, the Klingons had completely translated the works of Shakespeare and actually believed that Shakespeare himself was a Klingon, as famously noted by saying, you have not heard Shakespeare until you have heard him in the original Klingon. And so today, you shall. Tapatave da mut lechva vichwinis kuva yarda san vaksha O je sikti pa sambi ahe soubme nou me sikti el soubmo rin mo Sonnet 25 That those who are in favor with their stars or public honor and proud titles boast whilst I whom fortune of such triumph bars Unlooked for joy in that I honor most. Great princes' favorites their fair leaves spread, but as the marigold at the sun's eye, and in themselves their pride lies buried, for at a frown they in their glory die. The painful warrior, famous for fight, after a thousand victories once foiled, is from the book of honor raised quite, and all the rest forgot for which he toiled. Then happy I that love and am beloved, for I may not remove nor be removed. Hello, this is Sonnet 26. Lord of my love, to whom in visage thy merit hath my duty strongly knit, to thee I send this written embassage, to witness duty, not to show my wit. 
Duty so great, which wit so poor as mine may make seem bear, in wanting words to show it, but that I hope some good conceit of thine in thy soul's thought all naked may bestow it, till whatsoever star that guides my moving points on me graciously with fair aspect, and puts apparel in my tattered loving to show me worthy of thy sweet respect, then may I dare to boast how I do love thee. Till then not show my head where thou mayest prove me. Thank you. Sonnet 27 Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed. The dear repose for limbs with travel tired, but begins the journey in my head, to work my mind when body's works expired. For then my thoughts from far where I abide, intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee. Keep my drooping eyelids open wide. Look on darkness which the blind do see. Save that my soul's imaginary sight presents thy shadow to my sightless view, which, like a jewel hung in ghastly night, makes black night beauteous in her old face new. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind. For thee and for myself no quiet find. Sonnet 28 How can I then return in happy plight that I am debarred the benefit of rest when day's oppression is not eased by night but day by night and night by day oppressed and each though enemies to either's reign do in consent shake hands to torture me the one by toil the other to complain how far I toil still farther off from thee I tell the day to please him thou art bright, and dost him grace when clouds do blot the heaven. So flatter I the swart complexion night, when sparkling stars twire not, thou guilt's the even. But day doth daily draw my sorrows longer, and night doth nightly make grief's length seem stronger. <laughs> When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least, Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, Happily I think on thee, and then my state, Like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, Sings hymns at heaven's gate, For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, That then I scorn to change my state with kings. <laughs> Take those lips away from measure for measure. Hey, oh, take those lips away that so sweetly were forsworn, and those eyes the break of day lies that do mislead the morn. But my 
kisses bring again fields of love those fields in vain but my kisses bring again fields of love those fields in vain hide oh hide those hills of snow that thy frozen bosom wears on whose tops the peaks that grow on the crowns that April bears. But first set my poor heart free, bound in those icy chains by thee. But first set my poor heart free, bound in those icy chains by thee. Sonnet 30 When to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon up remembrance of things past I sigh the lack of many a things I sought and with old woes new wail my dear times waste then can I drown an eye, unused to flow for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavenly from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I pay new as if not paid before. But if I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. Sonnet 31 Thy bosom is endeared with all hearts, which I by lacking have supposed dead. And there reigns love, and all love's loving parts, And all those friends which I thought buried. How many a holy and obs obsequious tear Hath the dear religion, religious love stolen from mine eye, As interest of the dead, which now appear, but things removed that's hidden in thee lie. Love art the grave where buried love doth live, Hung with the trophies of my lovers gone, Who all their parts of me to thee did give, That do of many thou is now is thine alone. Their images I loved, I view in thee, and thou all they hast, all the all of me. Sonnet 32 If thou survive my well-contented day, when that churl death my bones with dust shall cover, and shalt by fortune once more resurvey these poor rude lines of thy deceased lover, compare them with the bettering of the time. And though they be outstripped by every pen, reserve them for thy for my love, not for their rhyme. Exceeded by the height of happier men, oh, then vouchsafe me, but this loving thought. Had my friend's muse grown with his this growing age, a dearer birth than this his love had brought, to march in ranks of better equipage. 
but since he died, and poets better prove, theirs for their style, I'll read for his for love. Sonnet 33 Full many a glorious morning have I seen Flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye, Kissing with golden face the meadows green, Gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy. Anon, permit the basest clouds to ride With ugly rack on his celestial face, And from the forlorn world his visage hide, Stealing unseen to west with this disgrace. Even so, my sun, one early morn did shine with all triumphant splendor on my brow, but out, alack, he was but one hour mine. The region cloud hath masked him from me now. Yet him, for this, my love no whit disdaineth. Sons of the world may stain when heaven's sun staineth. Thank you for coming to ReBooks. I'm Robert Cizak, reading William Shakespeare's sonnet number 34 for the Recycled Shakespeare Company. Why did thou promise such a beauteous day and make me travel forth without my cloak to let base clouds o'ertake me in my way, hiding thy bravery in their rotten smoke? Tis not enough that through the cloud thou break to dry the rain on my storm-beaten face. For no man well of such a salve can speak that heals the wound and cures not the disgrace. Nor can thy shame give fizzy to my grief. Though thou repent, yet I have still the weight the offender's sorrow lends but weak relief to him that bears the strong offense's freight. Ah, but those tears are pearl which thy love sheathes, and they are rich and ransom all ill deeds. Sonnet 35 No more be grieved at that which thou hast done, Roses have thorns and silver fountains mud. Clouds and eclipses stain both moon and sun, and loathsome canker lives in sweetest bud. All men make faults, and even I in this, authorizing thy trespass with compare, myself corrupting, salving thy amiss, excusing thy sins more than thy sins are. For to thy sensual fault I bring incense. Thy adverse party is thy advocate, and against myself a lawful plea commence. Such civil war is in my love and hate, that I an accessory needs must be to that sweet thief which sourly robs from me. Sonnet 36 by William Shakespeare. Let me confess that we too must be twain, although our undivided loves are one, so shall those blots that do with me remain. Without thy help, by me be born alone, in our two loves there is one respect. Though our lives a separable spite, which though it alter not love's sole effect, yet doth it steal sweet hours from love's delight. I may not evermore acknowledge thee, lest my bewailed guilt should do thee shame, nor thou with public kindness honor me, unless thou take that honor from thy name. But do not so. I love thee in such sort, as though being mine, mine is thy good report. Sonnet 37. As a decrepit father takes delight to see his active child do deeds of youth, so I, made lame, like fortune's dearest spite, take all my comfort of thy worth and truth. For whether beauty, birth, or wealth, or wit, or any of these all, or all, or more, entitled in thy parts do crowned sit, 
I make my love and graft to this store. So then I am not lame, poor, nor despised, whilst this shadow doth substance give, that I in thy abundance am sufficed, and by a part of all thy glory live. Look what is best, that best I wish in thee, this wish I have, ten times happy be. Sonnet 38 How can my muse want subject to invent, while thou dost breathe, that pourest into my verse thine own sweet argument, too excellent for every vulgar paper to rehearse? Oh, give thyself the thanks, if aught in me worthy perusal stand against thy sight. For who's so dumb that cannot write to thee, when thou thyself dost give invention light? Be thou the tenth muse, ten times more in worth than those old nine which rhymers invocate. And he that calls on thee, let him bring forth eternal numbers to outlive long date. If my slight muse do please these curious days, the pain be mine, but thine shall be the praise. Sonnet 39 Oh, how thy worth with manners may I sing, when thou art all the better part of me. What can mine own praise to mine own self bring? And what is't but mine own when I praise thee? Even for this let us divided live, And our dear love lose name of single one, That by this separation I may give, That due to thee which thou deservest alone. O absence, what a torment wouldst thou prove, Were it not thy sour leisure gave sweet leave, To entertain the time with thoughts of love, Which time and thought so sweetly doth deceive, and that thou teachest how to make one twain by praising him here who doth hence remain. Why, I have not another tear to shed. Besides, this sorrow is an enemy, and would usurp upon my watery eye and make them blind with tributary tears. And then which way shall I find revenge's cave? For these two heads seem to speak to me. And threat me, I shall never come to bliss, till all these mischiefs be returned again, even in their throats that have committed them. Come, let me see what task I have to do. You heavy people, circle me about, that I may turn to each of you, and swear unto my soul to right your wrong. And thou is made, come, come together, brother, take a head, and in this hand the other I will bear. Lavinia, thou shalt be employed these arms. Bear thou my hand, sweet wrench between your teeth. As for thee, boy, go get thee from my sight. Thou art an exile, and thou must not stay. Sonnet 40 Take all my loves, my love, yea, take them all. What hast thou then more than thou hast before? No love, my love, that thou mayest true love call. All mine was thine before thou hast this more. Then, if for my love thou my love receivest, I cannot blame thee for my love thou youest, but yet be blamed if thou thyself deceivest, by willful taste of what thyself refusest. I do forgive thy robbery, gentle thief, although thou steal thee all my poverty. And yet love knows it all great grief. To bear love's wrong, then hate's known injury. Lascivious grace, in whom all ill will shows. Kill me with spites, yet we must not be foes. This is Sonnet 41. Those pretty wrongs that liberty commits, when I am sometimes absent from thy heart, thy beauty and thy years full well befit. For still temptation follows where thou art. Gentle thou art, and therefore to be won. Beauteous thou art, therefore to be assailed. And when a woman woos, what son, woman's son will sourly leave her until he hath prevailed? Ah, me, but yet thou mist, 
mightest my seat forbear, and chide thy beauty and thy strained youth, who led thee in thy riot, even there, where thou art forced to break in twofold truth, here by thy beauty tempting her to thee, thine by thy beauty being false to me. Sonnet 42. Hmm. Hmm. That thou hast her, it is not all my grief, and yet it may be said I loved her dearly. That she hath thee is of my wailing chief, a loss in love that touches me more nearly. Loving offenders, thus I will excuse ye. Thou dost love her, because thou knowst I love her. And for my sake, even so doth she abuse me, suffering my friend for my sake to approve her. If I lose thee, my loss is my love's gain, and losing her, my friend hath found that loss. Both find each other, and I lose both twain, and both for my sake lay on me this cross. But here's the joy, my friend and I are one, Sweet flattery, then she loves but me alone. Sonnet 43. From this book, William Shakespeare. Complete sonnets. When most I wink, then do mine eyes best see. For all the day, they view things unrespected. But when I sleep, in dreams they look on thee, and darkly bright, are bright and dark directed. Then thou whose shadow shadows doth make bright, how would thy shadows form form happy show? To the clear day with thy much clearer light. When to unseeing eyes thy shade shines so, how would I say mine eyes be blessed made? By looking on thee in the living day. When in dead night thy fair imperfect shade through heavy sleep on sightless eyes doth stay, all days are nights to see till I see thee and nights bright days when dreams do show thee me sonnet 44 if the dull substance of my flesh were thought injurious distance should not stop my way for then despite of space i would be brought from limits far remote where thou dost stay no matter then although my foot did stand upon the farthest earth removed from thee for nimble thought can jump both sea and land as soon as think the place where he would be but ah thought kills that i am not thought to leap great lengths of miles when thou art gone but that so much of earth and water wrought i must attend times leisure with my moan receiving not by elements so slow but heavy tears badges of either's woe shakespearean sonnet number 45 the other two, slight air and purging fire, are both with thee wherever I abide. The first my thought, the other my desire. These present absent with swift motion slide. For when these quicker elements are gone, and tender embassy or of love to thee, my life being made of four with two alone, sinks down to death, oppressed with melancholy until life's composition be recurred by those swift messengers returned from thee, who even but now come back again assured of thy fair health recounting it to me. This told I joy, but then no longer glad, I send them back again, 
and straight grow sad. Sonnet 46, Le Sonnet 46 Mon cœur et mes yeux sont en lutte mortelle pour partager la conquête de ta vue. Mes yeux voudraient refuser à mon cœur la vue de ton portrait. Mon cœur soutient que tu habites sans lui, retraite que des yeux de cristal n'ont jamais pénétré. Mais les défendants repoussent cette prétention et disent que c'est en eux que se réfléchit ta belle image. Pour décider cette question, on a appelé un jury de pensée, toutes habitantes du cœur, et d'après leur sentence, la part des yeux transparents, ainsi que la part du pauvre, est fixée comme il suit. Ce qui est dû à mes yeux, c'est l'extérieur de ton être, et le droit de mon cœur, c'est l'amour intérieur de ton cœur. Sonnet 46 Mine eye and heart are at a mortal war, how to divide the conquest of thy sight. Mine eye, my heart, thy picture sight would bar. My heart, mine eye, the freedom of that right. My heart doth plead that thou in him dost lie, a closet never pierced with crystal eyes. But the defendant doth that plea deny, and says in him thy fair appearance lies. To side this title is impaneled a quest of thoughts, all tenets to the heart, and by their verdict is determined the clear eye's moiety and the dear heart's part. As thus, mine eye's do is thine outward part, and my heart's right, thine inward love of heart. Hello, my name is Christina Kloss, and this is sonnet number 47. Twixt mine eye and heart a league is made, and each doth good turns unto the other. When that mine eye is famished for a look, or my heart in love with sighs himself doth smother, with my love's picture then my eye doth make a feast, and to the painted banquet bids my heart. Another time, mine eye is my heart's guest, and in his thoughts of love doth share a part. So either by thy picture or my love, thyself away are recent still with me. For that thou not farther than my thoughts canst move, and I am still with them and they with thee. Or if they sleep, Thy picture in my sight awakes my heart, and my heart and eyes delight. Sonnet 48 How careful was I when I took my way, each trifle under truest bars to thrust, that to my use it might unused stay, from hands of falsehood and sure wards of trust. But thou, to whom my jewels trifles are, most worthy comfort, now my greatest grief, thou best of dearest and mine only care, art left the prey of every vulgar thief. Thee have I not locked up in any chest, save where thou art not, thou I feel thou art, within the gentle closure of my breast, from whence up pleasure thou mayst come and part, and even then thou wilt be stolen, I fear, for truth proves thievish for a prize so dear. Sonnet 49 Against that time, if ever that time come, When I shall see thee frown on my defects, When as thy love hath cast his utmost sum, Called to that audit by advised respects, Against that time when thou shalt strangely pass, And scarcely greet me with that sun thine eye, When love convert converted from the thing it was, shall reason shall find a settled grav gravity. Against that time I do ensconce me here, within the knowledge of thine own desert, and this my hand against myself of rear, to guard the lawful reasons on thy part. To leave for me thou hast the strength of laws, since I to love, I can allege no cause. Under the greenwood tree, from As You Like It. 
under the greenwood tree who loves to lie with me and tune his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat come hither come hither come hither here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather who doth a mission shun who loves to live in the sun be king the food he eats and pleased with what he gets come hither come hither come hither here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather under the greenwood tree